Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Well, nothing much new from the wrist dial. It's still in quite positive territory. But don't forget that this model is not designed to make you money. It's designed to save you money by getting you out during periods of risk off. And we're certainly not in a period of risk off. You can see that maybe we're in the sixth inning. Maybe we are in the eighth inning of an uptrend. And this uptrend will continue until something fundamental changes. And I don't see what fundamental can change before CPI because CPI is going to dictate this week whether the Fed can start its easing cycle in June, like they've penciled in, like they would like to start it or not. And that will determine uh, really what happens for the next couple of months. The very short end is basically trading right on top of this kind of three cuts in 2024, one cut in June, one cut in September and one cut in December. And we are within five, six basis points of where the market would be. As you can see in Z4, the predicted would be 95.40 and we're trading six, seven basis points below it because the market is beginning to doubt that we can do the cut in June. However, if we now take the cut in June away and recalculate, you will see that the predicted is going to be, in Z4, is going to be something like 20 basis points below where we currently are. So this tells you that if we take away at least 50% or 60% of the likelihood of a cut in June because the CPI is going to be hot, i.e. it's going to be above expectations, which would reduce these odds considerably, probably almost to zero, we have something like 15 to 20 basis points to go down on Wednesday when the CPI is announced. So the short end is certainly going to have at least a 15 basis point move on it. And it's likely, if it's hot, to be 15 down or 5 to 7 up if it's in line and probably 10 higher if it's cool. Cool will take June to 100% likelihood, I am absolutely sure. But that is, those are the odds. The odds are that it moves more to the downside than to the upside, uh, you know, depending on what the CPI is. And you can see that it's almost a two to one kind of move in terms of uh, how far it moves on the numbers. As far as bonds are concerned, it's quite obvious that the yield curve will move on the numbers substantially. If we get a cool CPI, that will take the odds, as I've shown you, to almost 100% for a cut in June. And therefore, that will be the first of the three cuts that the Fed has penciled in. So the short end is going to feel it most, and we will steepen the yield curve if the CPI is cool, and we will flatten it if it's not. A high CPI gives us certainly a bit of a flatter curve and the twos will move the most. So what is going to happen on a hot CPI? We are certainly going to break out of this range which we've been in for several weeks, basically between 455 and 475 and we'll go to at least this kind of area. 492 to 499, i.e. doubting that cuts start anytime soon <clears throat> or that we can have even more than one cut during the uh, during 2024. Don't forget that we are really getting to a stage where the Fed is unlikely to cut ahead of the party conferences and therefore the first cut could be November, December if we get any cuts at all during 2024. And there is no alternative to this yield curve flattening if 
we get a hot CPI. So those are the twos, the fives, they will definitely go to this 450 area and trade there. And the tens will try to trade this kind of area around the 450 to 450, 452 area, but definitely with a tendency to uh, flatten on a, hot, on a hot number. This is the two tens now. A hot number will take us back up towards 47 without a doubt. And if we have a look at then two thirties, that will take us back up here without a doubt around the 31 to 32 area. What can I say? There, there is no alternative to the uh, flattening if the number is high. If there is no start in sight for the cutting uh, cycle that the Fed would like to execute, then the twos really have nowhere to go but up in yield together with the sofa. And the thirties will quite like that because it means that monetary policy remains tighter for longer. And even though we have all the issuance in the uh, threes, tens and thirties next week, it's still the yield curve will still flatten, might not flatten as much as it would have done without the issuance, but it will definitely still flatten. As far as Germany is concerned, it will be exactly the same kind of move as in the US, but less so. This is the Schatz. 299 is what I have penciled in on a hot CPI number in the US, and then probably, you know, even further to around the 308. No cutting cycle in the US definitely delays perception of the cutting cycle in the EU. We have the ECB as well on Thursday, i.e. the day after the CPI, and I doubt that they can be um, bullish, as it were, or uh, indicate when they expect the cutting cycle to start, unless inflation in the US also starts moderating. Because if inflation in the US is not moderating, it won't moderate that much in the EU either. The indications are that inflation in the EU is moderating faster than in the US, but the curves will still trade roughly at the same pace. So the bubble, the crucial level is going to be here around the 245, 248. We start closing through there, we are likely to go back up to here around the 262. And in the Bund, this is the absolute key level, 252. If it starts going through there, we will definitely go and trade up towards 268. Very little doubt in my mind that those are the kinds of moves that happen on a hot CPI. On a cold CPI, the yield curve, even in Germany, should start steepening because it brings forward the expectations of cuts in the EU as well, or at l very least, it cements them. So the EU will do at least as much as the Fed. And if the Fed is penciled in for three, we should have at least three penciled in for the EU as well. And they should start doing them faster than the Fed, i.e. At some, even if they start at the same time as the Fed, the perception should be that they will go further than the Fed. The differentials between the US and Germany have started to move. We've had, you know, what is this? Something like a 10 basis point move last week in twos twos. And then fives fives, we've had another 10 basis point move and even tens tens, we've had something like a 10 basis point move. So you can see the curve is basically shifting parallel that 
Germany is not going up nearly as much in yield as the US. Now, a hot number in the US will definitely take us to around this kind of level, 205 to 207 in differentials. And probably then we start looking for levels around here, 212, 213. So you can see how important next week is. It's far more important for the US than it is for the uh, for Germany, but it's Germany is still going to react the same way as the US, just much less so. It makes a lot more sense to be long of Germany and short of the US because those are the odds. If the number is hot, you will get a much bigger move in the US than in Germany. And the flattening and or steepening is going to be the same. This is now twos fives in Germany. On a hot CPI, we start breaking up through here, or at least very much testing it. So that's, you know, five to seven basis points of flattening. If the number is cool, I'm sure that the cutting cycle of the ECB will be cemented in stone and we go down towards 35 that's in twos fives and twos tens it's much the same if the number is cool we should start going back down towards this kind of 30 level and finding support there and when finally we start the cutting cycle and it happens we should start breaking down through 25 but it's a long way away yet. I'm, all I'm showing you is that the flattening or the steepening is the same in either yield curve and will occur for exactly the same reasons. Don't forget that the twos in Germany are a long way away from, their, uh, from where the ECB is, so they're discounting quite a lot already. If the numbers are hot, the shats is going to get murdered just as much or nearly as much, I would rather say, than the two year in the US. Very little doubt that the steepening and or flattening occurs for the same reasons in both markets. The dollar had a very quiet week and basically it closed very much where it opened. There was a very small range and nothing much happened. I don't think that that will last. If the numbers are hot, then what happens? You get a situation where the yield differentials, as I've showed you, go out. And the ECB is constrained. It delays its cuts in an economy which probably very much needs them, in an economy which has lower inflation and also has much lower productivity and much lower activity and which is on the cusp of zero growth the whole time. It doesn't take very much to go from zero to minus and therefore if the ECB is forced to delay its cuts or on Thursday basically makes it clear that it's going to do whatever the Fed does and the Fed does nothing for the rest of the year or the market starts pricing that the Fed won't be able to cut at all this year then I really don't see any um, alternative to the FX taking the strain because if the euro on top appreciates then you're getting a much tighter policy in the ECB. So I would have thought that 105.40, this kind of level, is going to be very, you know, the least that you can expect from the dollar and probably over time a little bit higher because the dollar has to take the strain. If the US wants to run a very tight policy, and don't forget they keep on telling you policy is restrictive, well, if policy is restrictive in the US, then it must be also restrictive in the EU. Uh, and if those differentials then start going out, then it's, you know, the, the dollar has to take the strain and it has to go towards this 106 area. 
that's the way I see it. I can't see any alternative to it for the time being. In terms of Euro USD, this is the kind of level that I'd be looking at uh, to trade on a hot number in the US, something like 10670. And on a cold number, I think that the cutting cycle starts getting priced in and we are going to go to around just short of 110, 109.50-ish at the very least, I would have thought. Because once you start penciling in or cementing in that the Fed starts cutting in June, then the market just has the, you know, the bit between its teeth and it's going for more, more cuts than the Fed has penciled in and therefore you get the weakness in the dollar. But just notice how we are at a flat curve here in terms of uh, the moving averages. Wherever we go from here, it's going to be quite violent and quite quick. This is a very long-term chart, basically from 2010, of gold versus tip with dividends. And this is without dividends. So you can see what a huge difference this makes. With dividends, we're still very much in the range that we've been in for the past 15 years. Without dividends, naturally, we are way higher. What does this mean? Well, I don't know why gold is going up as much as it is. I won't pretend that I do. All I know is the theories that are circulating and those are the weaponization of the dollar, starting from you know well, the seizing of the Russian assets of the central bank, uh, the Chinese uh, losing you know f fearing that the same thing might one day happen happen to them, and therefore buying gold, etc., etc., etc. Whatever you think about gold. You also have to understand that it has zero yield and therefore over time it actually has to appreciate in order to retain its purchasing power, as it were. Now, to me, 2% over CPI is 2% more than gold yields and therefore I just cannot understand why anybody who is a law-abiding citizen living in the West who does not fear that his assets might be seized by the US you know, or whoever would prefer to hold gold over tips, especially at this kind of level. We might go and test these highs, but you can see what happened last time. Last time, anybody who bought gold lost over the course of ten, you know, six years, lost almost 50% of their value compared to tips. All I'm saying is that since I live in the West, and I presume 99% of you also do, you really at some stage when we start hitting this around 210 area with dividend you've got to start saying well why would i not prefer to hold tips two percent over cpi unless i think cpi is a manufactured figure and i only i think only nutters think of that think that way uh, in which in that case you just have to switch and that is what I'll be looking to do in the next couple of weeks. I'll be looking to sell the gold that I bought and basically invest it in long-term tips and forget about it because this is getting stupid. This is a weekly chart of cash gold. And once it broke through the old-time highs, it just went. Now, if you consider this to be a weekly kind of bull flag, the target if you just add this on top, is somewhere between 2350 and 2375. You can see this acceleration here, which was followed by a very hard sell-off of weeks. And I think much the same thing is likely to happen. We are likely to go a little bit higher and then have a very nasty week down and trade you know, towards this 2200 level. 
I think this 2200 level is going to be pivotal. I don't think we're going to break it for a very long time to the downside. And, you know, something like 2400, 2200, this kind of pattern, I think for several weeks is more likely than not. I just can't understand, as I showed you in the previous chart, why anyone sane would prefer to own gold against tips at these ratio levels of the two. It just doesn't make sense if the Chinese, for whatever reason, need to buy gold because they need to you know, save their wealth from devaluation in the yuan or this or that, does not mean that we in the West have to care about that at all. At some stage, gold against tips reverses very, very hard. By all means, if you're long of gold, let it run for a bit, but be very, very aware that it will snap back at some stage because it just has to. It's mathematics. DBC had a very good week, and I think that 24.39 test at some stage is on the cards over the next couple of weeks. It makes sense. The move between gold and DBC was very, very limited last week. I doubt very much that we can break higher at the moment. I think DBC is a much better bet than gold if you want to hedge some kind of geopolitical risk, especially in the Middle East. Oil is the thing that should perform much better on any kind of war between Iran and anyone else because if Iran closes or succeeds in closing the Straits of Hormuz for any length of time before the US naturally gets involved and opens them up again, oil is going to spike to incredible levels. And here is oil. I don't know what you know geopo geopolitics has in store for us. No one else does either. Events happen. It just tells me, this chart tells me that we have turned the corner in oil, that any falls are going to be limited to something like 83, 83 and a quarter, and that we should reaccelerate at some stage and test this kind of 97, 97 and a half area. So I'm more bullish on oil than I am on gold. I think that ratio will definitely change in favor of oil. I don't think that even if nothing happens in the Middle East in terms of you know, a hot conflict, I think that OPEC is unlikely to settle for a much lower oil price in gold terms. And therefore, I think that any kind of a dip to something around, uh, around here 8250 82 is a very good opportunity to buy some calls on oil calls on dbc i think commodities are going to do far better than uh, gold and anything else over the next couple of months let's start equities with spy over tlt I just want to show you SPY over TLT and SPY over IEF to give you an idea that for equities to start breaking down and breaking down hard, they, you know, it's only going to be the bonds that are going to enable that to happen. So the bond market needs to spike higher in yield, lower in price to, you know, get, have any reason to start selling equities short. You can trade them short for brief periods of time or hedge them at appropriate levels, but to short equities as an asset class and to think that they're going down, you need the bond market to break hard. Now, could a very hot CPI cause the markets, the bond markets to break hard? Yes. As I showed you, they could go 20, 25 basis points easy. Would that be enough to knock SPY down for a couple of days? Yes. But I don't think that the ratio 
itself is going to get much worse than 539. So if bonds go down 2% and equities go down 3% because of volatility of the high volatility of the bond market, it really isn't, you know, it, it's 3%. It's 150 points in the S&Ps. It's not 500. It's not 700. I really don't think that the S&Ps are going to care whether the Fed starts cutting this year or next year or even never, as long as the bonds don't accelerate past a real yield of, say, two, two and a quarter, two and a half percent. If that doesn't happen, then equities are just going to consolidate for a few days, weeks, months, and then re-establish the, uh, the uptrend. So it's not equities that you want to really sell hard. You can trade them from the short side um, at good levels, but I don't think that you ever press into a hole. No reason to sell them at the moment as an asset class. I just want to reinforce this point about bonds and equities by showing you the move and this is the move index. And as you can see, it's trying to break down below very, very important levels here between 90 and 97. And what do I think this move index is going to do? Well, unless the numbers that we start getting for inflation are very hot, the 30-year and the 10-year aren't really going to care all that much, not more than 15, 20 basis points, what, when the Fed starts its cutting cycle, or even if it starts its cutting cycle. What they're going to care about is, is inflation accelerating or is it just sticky? Sticky just means that the Fed will hold rates tight for longer until it stops being sticky. And that is not enough to make equities swoon. So let's have a look at the move divided by the VIX. This is the move over the VIX three month. And as you can see, it's been in an uptrend for a long, long time, and it's now breaking back down. This to me says that the volatility of equities and the, the volatility of bonds is tied together again. If bonds are very volatile, and let's face it, they can only be very volatile in, to the downside in price and upside in yield, then equities will be more volatile than they are, but still contained because equities are a more volatile asset class. So if bonds move uh, 2%, equities will move 3%. But on the downside, if bonds are just stable, then equities are going to outperform to the upside. This chart of move over VIX 3M tells me that what I, you know, what I told you on the chart of the uh, SPY TLT and SPY IEF is correct, it's triangulated that equities, yes, they will be more volatile than the bonds, but the tightness of the volatility is going to be quite high, i.e. they're going to be very correlated and therefore unless bonds really start breaking down, you cannot expect a breakdown in equities. This is a 195 minute chart of the SPX and if we enlarge we will see what is happening here. Very narrow range and every time it breaks it comes back to the center line. It, it, it's just unlikely before CPI to be much lower than 5180. That is the kind of level that I would expect to hold for the first couple of days, Monday and Tuesday, and then we see. Then certainly we have the potential to go down and certainly fill this gap and potentially fill this gap down to here to 51.17, all on the CPI number, without a doubt. But as I showed you, that will constrain the volatility, I'm quite sure. So I have buy levels around 
this kind of area, 5120. That's where I want to get them. I think there's very little likelihood of SPX trading below 5120, even after CPI. And that is where the level that I want to own them. I want to show you also the index with the highest beta, which is the NDX. And if we enlarge this area, I think that unless and until we start closing weekly closes or at the very least daily closes below 17,650, this is just a huge consolidation which eventually resolves to the upside. The very least the market can do is fill in some gaps, right? And it's just not doing it. I very much doubt that we can be below 17,800 by CPI. I will definitely be a buyer of this level before CPI. And even after CPI, very unlikely that we can close below the 17,500 area. This is my first warning that, you know, it's not as strong as it appears, 17,650. But I really doubt that we can close in these levels. We can spike to them, then come back to the 17,650. This could be an ABC, which basically targets this kind of area. But you really want to be a buyer of calls down here. I'm not going to bore you with a whole load of other charts because all the equity markets to me look the same in whichever country I look at. I think that I would really like to own Europe around this 4870 area or down to 4850 on this monthly chart. So 4870 to 4850 is where I'd very, very much like to own Europe. I think the risk reward there is going to be very good for some very good, you know, sort of uh, ratio spreads in calls. I think that we will retest the top side in Europe very, very soon. I don't think that this is a top formation. I think that any kind of pullback to these areas is going to be a very good risk reward for longs. I've changed all the levels and these are the very important levels that they mustn't break on the top side. We shall see after CPI. If CPI is hot, all these levels go and then you are looking for 15 basis points through them kind of thing. And that will definitely hit equities for the time being. Um, and it will probably take two, three weeks for them to recover. They will probably go further than bonds, as I showed you, by, you know, 20, 30 percent more in percentage terms. So if, if bonds go 2 percent, then equities will go 3, 4 percent. But it's still, to me, a buy the dip market in equities. And also it will be a decent level to short, um, to short volatility when bonds get up there. Because I don't, can't, cannot see that inflation is going to accelerate. I can see it being sticky and forcing the Fed to remain tighter for longer. But I can't see that we are going to go back in the realms of 4%, 5% inflation. In which case, the move index will not uh, spike higher. And move over VIX 3M, which I showed you, will also continue lower. And that is a buy the dip environment in equities. Naturally, I will be tweeting to you throughout the week, but to me, buy the dip in equities still holds.